that my name is Dr Gemma Dold. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist. I've been working in CAMS and the neurodevelopmental pathway in West Sussex uh, for Sussex Partnership for about 21 years. And I think in all the time that I've worked for the service, this is actually the first time we've ever done a large scale event like this. So we will be asking you for your feedback at the end of the session and any ideas for any future topics. If you have any thoughts on them, we'd be really grateful for those. So what I'm going to do is just move over to the slide deck. So I'm going to start this. So you should just see the title page there. So... Before we start, just want to go through some basics with you. So just to remind you all that you are in conference mode, which means that your microphones and your cameras are all disabled. There is a chat function available for comments um, and questions, but you'll be chatting directly with myself and Melissa as the presenters. We have had uh, a lot of questions in advance. I just want to say a big thank you to people that have uh, submitted them in advance. And what I've tried to do is to design the talk today around some of those questions that have come in. Um, all of your questions are really incredibly important, but I'm just going to have to apologise in advance because I'm not going to be able to get around to answering all your specific questions. As you can see, there is a chat function here. I just need to let you know whilst I'm talking, I cannot see the chat function, which is my Melissa is here to help me. So we'll structure it. We will have um, a quick comfort break. I've got two sections. We have a five minute comfort break. And at the around the time of the comfort break, we'll also have a quick question and answer, but just around the content in the first part of at the talk. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is I get lots and lots of questions along the lines of what can I do if and what do I do with my young person's distress. Now it's not that easy to answer that with lots of additional without that additional background information. So what I'm looking for is to understand some of the triggers and the functions before we can actually come up with any advice or tips on how to manage the distress behaviour. Now hopefully through the course of this session I'm going to teach you how to do some of that so we'll learn that together um, and the aim of this session and in terms of managing distress behaviour is around understanding the behaviour, predicting it and planning it in advance so we're preventing the behaviour. Okay, so the first part, I'll be going through some just some general background information so that we all have a similar understanding through the course of this presentation. So it includes sort of what is distress behaviour, what is autism, um, for those that don't know interoception, I'm going to introduce that. There's another sense. Um, it's really useful for to help us understand why some young people get distressed particularly when they're on the autistic spectrum. We'll then have a quick question session with about a five minute break. We'll work out the timings as we get there. And then we'll come back for possibly the most important part, um, which is the bit about understanding the behaviour. And I'm going to teach you some techniques on how to do that. We are using positive behaviour support. I'm going to use ABC charts. We're doing functional analysis. And I'll be giving some quick tips as well as we're talking. Um, there have been some questions, additional questions, there's some themes, a lot around accessing services. So what I've done is at the end of the slide deck, I've added some of those services in. I'm not sure if we'll get around to all of them. And I'm very aware that I've put in some West Sussex orientated um, services. So um, Melissa's very kindly said that she'll add some more in around East Sussex and Brighton and Hove. And that will come out to as part of a, a digital little goodie bag afterwards. So we'll move on to what is distress behaviour. So in order to understand what it is, we need to understand what's influencing it. So distress behaviour is a way to communicate and express feelings, particularly when things are outside someone's control. It's a sign that they're actually asking for help, but they just don't know how to do it. This is when they've kind of hit their absolute threshold. They can't control their distress anymore. Normally at this point, they actually may not be able to explain what has caused it, may never be able to explain what's caused it. They just know that something inside them feels wrong and it feels awful. Distress behaviour is also another way to get rid of a buildup of that stress, which could be anxiety, could be overstimulation, could be understimulation and a way of helping them to calm down eventually. Now, this is part of our stress response system because it creates unpleasant physical symptoms that we need to get rid of. So what I'm going to do is just go into a little bit of physiology so that we just understand where this stress response is coming from. So the question, why is it outside someone's control? Why are we getting to the point someone's having a meltdown? 
So this is all part of the fight, flight or freeze response mechanism. Some of you might be familiar with that. What we're seeing is that in a situation, the brain or our thoughts are interpreting a threat. Now, there might be an actual threat. You might be in danger. You might need to take action. It might be that you've perceived a threat. So other people might not think it's a threatening situation, but your thoughts, your brain is saying, I'm not safe. What that does is it stimulates the hypothalamus and that's going to release two hormones. One's called adrenaline, one's called cortisol, and that increases the blood sugar. Now, what happens is you get a buildup of these hormones in your body, which is a huge amount of energy, so a massive influx of energy. Now, what happens if you're on a fight or flight moment is you will run or you will fight. And part of the process of that is releasing this pent up energy. Now, quite often in our situation, day to day situation nowadays and for these young people, they're not necessarily going to go anywhere. So we've got this stress response and these hormones starting to build up in their system. So what we start seeing are some warning signs that these hormones are being released. These are called amber stress symptoms. There are warning signs. So it can be restlessness, irritability. You might notice that they're eating less or saying they're just not hungry. They could be sleeping badly, waking up repeatedly, waking up very early. The OCD, if you've got OCD, might be increasing. You might see more repetitive behaviours, more repetitive questions, needing far more reassurance than normal. So these are all our warning signs that their stress is building up. So if we're noting the, noticing these warning symptoms, we need to start taking action because the next phase is the distress behaviour. So we're going to look at two different types of distress behaviour. Um, it's really important we understand the two because when we later on are looking at recording some of the behaviour so we can understand it, we need to make sure we're keeping an eye on both of these. So there are different ways we show stress, some are a little bit more obvious, the meltdowns are external so we can see what's happening, shutdowns are more internalised so they're harder to spot, they're far more subtle. So in a meltdown we might see verbal or physical aggression, it's a sign there's a temporary loss of control, so it might include hitting, shouting, biting, spitting, I'm sure you can think of lots of different ones for the physical meltdowns. But we've also got shutdowns. These are actually harder to spot because the individual might just get more silent than normal. They might suddenly withdraw. They might stop interacting or refuse to interact. They might move themselves or take themselves away to a quiet or a dark space or a small space, or they might freeze. They might not be able to move at all. So what we need to do is keep an eye on both of these. What we might find is that a shutdown might be a warning sign that you've got a meltdown coming next. So it's great to keep an eye out on those. We also notice that shutdowns sometimes happen afterwards, after a meltdown. And that's because it's like a reset button. So don't worry. If a young person goes into a shutdown, what we're asking you to do is just keep them safe, keep them quiet and give them plenty of time to recover. So it's the same for meltdowns. We're saying, if you're supporting someone during a meltdown, this is a reactive sort of strategy. So what we're doing is just making sure they're safe, other people are safe. So you might ask them to move, you might ask, if you can't ask them to move, you might need to move other people, particularly siblings, might need to move, particularly if they're part of the trigger as well. So reduce any unnecessary communication or noise. There might be background noise or smells that are quite overwhelming. Think about reducing the stimulation and the demands. And the same is, that we do for the shutdowns, very, very similar, okay? So it will take time to recover after a meltdown or a shutdown. They're generally extremely exhausting. We also know that from the release of hormones that it can take, well, the literature says about an hour for actually these hormones to settle down again. Some people will tell you it could take two or three hours after a big meltdown for someone to settle down. Now, what we've got to remember is that at any point at that stage, they've still got quite high levels of adrenaline or cortisol in their system. So anything else can set them off. So we call that the rumbling phase. So after they've had a meltdown or a shutdown, please have a think about what happens next and whether you can keep them in a quieter space and reduce the demands and expectations on them over that time. Now I'd like to have a look at autism. Everyone's individual. 
Exactly that, with different strengths, different weaknesses, different challenges, different needs, different things that bring us pleasure and joy. So strategies that work for one person, not necessarily going to work for someone else. And it might work, strategies might work in one situation, but may not work in a different situation. So it's quite difficult to predict. So we're going to start off just by understanding the main features of autism. So by definition, whether they're diagnosed, not diagnosed, waiting for a diagnosis, or you're just worried about general social communication or language skills, people with, on the autistic spectrum have difficulties interacting, communicating with each other. Now, this might include not speaking at all. This might include speaking in some situations, but not others. So we have selective mutes that might be comfortable speaking at home with their family and people they're very confident around, less comfortable outside. So they may not speak to teachers or other people, or they might need to whisper to someone that they trust. People on the autistic spectrum need longer time to process information. So we need to give them more time. We need to break the information down. We might need to repeat it and we need to be more literal in the language that we use. So language is really important here. So keep an eye on sayings and idioms that we might use every day, but actually quite difficult to understand if you're a literal person. Keep an eye on the use of sarcasm and particularly if you're in situations where you're saying we'll do that later, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. They're all incredibly vague and difficult to understand. People on the autistic spectrum sometimes have difficulties recognising facial expressions, and that includes their own. They're also going to struggle understanding their internal feelings. So they might have lots of physical feelings going on, but they may not be able to match, match that to an emotion. People on the autistic spectrum engage in repetitive behaviours and thoughts and actions and repetitive questions sometimes. And they're there because it's helping them to deal with emotions, a whole range of emotions. They also use them for self-soothing and for calming down. So don't assume that they're having a negative influence. They can actually be quite helpful. And that's what we want to have a look through when we're recording behaviours as well and helping us understand distressed behaviours. So change is incredibly difficult, even if it's incredibly small. So if we're thinking about looking at what might be triggering distress, we may need to be paying attention to things we wouldn't normally pay attention to. So not just the obvious triggers, but we need to have a think about, did something in the environment change? Has someone moved furniture around in the background? Has someone come in that has strong perfume? They might be wearing very strong deodorant. So it might be really, really subtle. So at first look, we go, oh, I've got no idea what set them off. But actually, if we start understanding some of their sensory needs, which we'll come to later, we can think, oh, OK, maybe there was something in that environment. So I've added masking on here. People talk about masking, particularly in girls, but it also happens in boys. Um, what they do is they learn to copy social behaviours off their peers and adults around them or they do it deliberately, they're copying so that they're hiding behaviours that they're embarrassed about. So they mask their difficulties. So to other people, sometimes at school, it looks like they're coping absolutely fine. The first you'll know that they're not coping is when they come home and they're incredibly distressed. And then you're having to manage the distress. So it's really helpful to, to let people know and understand about masking for you as well. Because sometimes you think, oh, great, you know, they seem to be doing really great. You don't know if they're masking. And masking, the young people say, and adults will say, so, is incredibly exhausting. So if someone's masking just for a short period of time or for a very long time, most of the day, they will be absolutely exhausted. So actually their tolerance levels are going to go down. They're going to be more likely to react. So another main feature of autism are sensory sensitivities, and this can relate to all of the senses. Um, so, for example, with, we've got to think about noise, smells, touch, bright lights. And what happens is they become incredibly painful and incredibly overwhelming. So what happens is that triggers the distress. Now, what I've got for you today is I said we're going to introduce the concept of interoception for those that don't know it. So it's one of the eight senses. Some literature says there's six senses, um, but this is around the ability to sense and understand what's going on in your body. So any signals that are unclear make it hard for autistic people to identify what's going on. And that's around it makes it difficult for them to manage their emotions, to deal with stress, to understand when they're experiencing pain, to understand when they're unwell and then being able to communicate it is also very challenging. 
So I've got a video which Miss is going to play in a minute, but we've got sort of eight senses listed here. So we're talking about sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, movement, balance, and then interoception. So I've got this information in the slide deck for you. So when that comes out afterwards, it's a YouTube clip. Um, I've got the link in the slide deck. If you get it electronically, the link might work. If not, you just have to copy and paste that into the Google bar. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can switch over and then Melissa is going to play the recording for us. Um, there's a very catchy tune. There's no words. So it's all something for you to, to watch. And there are also some subtitles as well. Um, and I'll cover a little bit of what it said after the presentation.
It's a really, really nice video there. Uh, probably something you want to go back and have a look again. So, so Google that or look at the link when the pack comes through. Um, so it's really, really helpful um, in understanding some of the difficulties that people on the autistic spectrum have when they're struggling to interpret their feelings. So I'm assuming that's screen playing again. So there's a really nice description. I don't know if you noticed that in there. I really like the one that uh, Gracie, 13 year old, came up with because she said, when you're oversensitive, there's so much going on and there's so many signals going on in her body. She described it like a bitter ball being shaken. It's also really helpful for us to understand that not only is it about having too many signals and then not being able to interpret them because you're experiencing so much within your body. They also talked about being undersensitive or having dull or muted signals. And I think there's a really nice um, description by Declan, who was 12, who turned around and who said that actually he only knows at the last minute when he's distressed because he doesn't notice all the warning signs himself that are building up. So it just comes out like a great big explosion. So in terms of interoception, what we're looking at is we're having to help the young person understand what is going on for them. Now, we can't sense that. So some of that's around predicting what's going on for them. So are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they in pain? Are they becoming unwell? We we'll also put puberty in there, so hormonal changes for boys as well as for girls. Um, think about monthly cycles as to some of the behaviour change depending on the time of the month. We've also got sleep, so it's quite difficult for young people to understand the impact of being sleep deprived. So they may not understand that actually their tolerance levels are going to be considerably slower and lower. In terms of interoception as well, you've got lots and lots of different messages going on. It's really easy to get mixed messages for you to feel confused. So sometimes you might, there might be a signal for hunger, but actually your body's interpreting that as anxiety. Something's wrong, your body feels funny, you get anxious. And actually what happens as an adult, you then end up managing the anxiety without realizing that actually the child's just hungry. And maybe by giving them something to eat, or to drink, actually the symptoms go and then the anxiety comes down. The same with sadness and anger. So if you are someone on the autistic spectrum, certainly children, they don't always understand the difference between the two. So if they're sad, they'll express it as anger. So sometimes it's helping them to understand the difference or naming that for them. So are you sad? Do you think this is sadness rather than anger? They might still express it in the same way. But think about, are we getting mixed messages? Are we actually, in terms of an action plan later on, are we targeting the right thing? So if we're going to identify and prevent this distress building up, are we actually dealing with the main trigger? Or is there something else that's going on underneath? It's a bit about being a detective. So autistic people also like don't like changes of routine. So they like routine, they like regularity, they like some predictability. So any unexpected events, and they do happen quite often in life, we can't always predict what's going to happen, but can set off a meltdown. Transitions between activities can be extremely difficult. So it could be something big, so it could be like moving from year six in primary, going up to year seven in secondary school, or it could be something a little bit smaller, like you saying, can you stop your activity, come off your PlayStation and have dinner. That transition, can be very stressful. So again, if we're thinking about what support are we putting in for the young person, are we actually dealing with the meltdowns or do we need to deal with the cause of the meltdown? So if we've got some transition coming up, so your young person might have just started year six, that's the perfect time to start worrying for year seven. They're not gonna wait until the term or the last few weeks before they go up um, to secondary school. It can start considerably earlier. So actually we need to have a think about what big transitions are coming up. It could be that they've got a school trip coming up, which they're super excited about, but along with that excitement comes a lot of anxiety. And the school trip might not be for many months, but it's something they could be anxious about or a holiday that they can be anxious about. So have a think about, they definitely don't like unstructured times. So I'm talking about school holidays are the obvious ones, but also weekends. So when they're at school, if they enjoy going to school, there is a structure to the school day. They get up, they go, they have a break, there's a set lunch time, there's an afternoon break, they go home. And each in between each chunk, there's sort of activity structures in between. We don't tend to have the same structure at weekends, particularly if you're a very busy family and there are kids going to different clubs and you're out and about, um, even just shopping, visiting, 
friends and family, you don't have so much of a routine. So it starts to become a little bit more unpredictable. Um, so if we're thinking about that, maybe later on in a plan, we might try and create a little bit of a, a routine around that. And if we can't, what we're doing is then, then giving them advance warning. So I mentioned earlier about ambiguous language. So it's a sarcasm saying later, maybe tomorrow, it might be in a difficult situation and you just don't have time to think or deal with it and say, right, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow, or you can have it tomorrow because I can't get it now. Um, just think about and make a mental note if you say things like that, because they're very vague. Now you may not be intending to do it tomorrow you just need to deal with the situation in the here and now and it's just a comment that you've made but actually if you suddenly get a meltdown tomorrow or next week it might be because your young person has remembered what you've said and it hasn't materialized the following day so do try and make a mental note or change your language okay because that can trip you up later on so just stress Sorry, behavior Daniel. Oh, sorry, just a couple of people have said they're having some issues with the um, with the sound. So most people are saying that they can they can hear OK. But if you are having any um, issues, then please um, just pop me a message and let me know. Um, it might be that there's something on your um, your own device that needs to um, be adjusted. But um, I think a lot of people are saying the videos sometimes aren't great either. But we haven't got any more videos now, have we, Gemma? So hopefully... No, that is it for videos. The, yeah. the, the, there is a particular challenge, certainly with the videos. It's it's in the evening. Uh, so what's happening? We've got more people using just the Internet on the whole. Um, but also if you've got other people in your household that are using bandwidth, so you've certainly if you've got anyone gaming in the house. It can take up the bandwidth. So it, it can affect the delivery of the videos, but it can also affect the sounds that's coming through. So we'll, we'll try our best and we'll carry on. Um, Thanks, Gemma. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so autistic people as well, um, they don't like their rituals or routines or repetitive behaviours being interrupted. Um, so like I said, it can be because they're self-soothing or trying to calm themselves down or they're building themselves up and preparing for something. So any interruption, you're going to see some distress behaviour. One thing that's really important to have a think about here is autistic overwhelm, and that's a build up of stress. So it's not an instant thing. It might be you've asked them to do something. It's the final straw and you've got a big, a big explosion or they've gone into shutdown. You're thinking, oh, I've asked them that before and I've not had that reaction. I wonder where that's come from. Or you're getting lots of reactions. You're thinking this is feeling a little bit unusual. It could be because there's stress building up. So there are lots of reasons for that. School is a particular stressor for our young people, but it could also be that there's some loss bereavement trauma or you might there might be some trauma triggers going on now when I talk about trauma it's not necessarily the obvious things because actually someone on the autistic spectrum might say it's the noise at school I find that really traumatic so if there is a noise it's similar or the fire alarm might have gone off and that's really really distressed them so actually something in the here and now might have just tipped into a trigger something that's happened in the past so it's not always that easy when we're trying to understand why has a child or some young person gone into meltdown or shutdown it may not be about the here and now so again that's about being a bit of a detective but really having a think about have you had really busy hectic evenings days weekends has that happened over the course of several weeks um and are we seeing this stress building up because they haven't had enough quiet time time to sort of calm and get rid of all of the overstimulation. And of course, what we need to be mindful of is that we know that young people on the autistic spectrum in particular um, do tend to have higher anxiety and depression levels. So it's about getting that mental health support um, for them. So we just got to the end of the first section. So that's just background information. The next bit is the bit where we're going to start looking at using some techniques to understand those behaviours. And actually by using the, the techniques that we're using, you can start seeing and playing around. It's about being creative and doing something differently to try and influence the behaviour. So, Melissa, are there any particular questions in the chat around the first section? Um, there was one around kind of rephrasing. Um, I like asking, um, let me just find it again. We'll do that tomorrow, or we'll do that later. So how would you look to rephrase that? Um, it depends on the situation. <laughs> like I say this is the bit that we're going to come on to later on. So we kind of need to understand what was going on at the time. So, you know, if they are having a meltdown and they're just making multiple demands of you, so can I have this, can I have that? And you're going, you know, I need to keep everyone safe. I just need to calm you down. Um, in that context, I'll just be saying this is not the right time to be talking about that. I'll talk about it when you're calm. 
So you're actually rewarding the calm behavior, not reinforcing the distress behavior. So, and particularly if you're getting pulled into those kind of difficult conversations, um, it's just about saying, I'm not talking about that now. And you will need to stick with that. And so we're just keeping you safe. We're keeping you quiet. We can give you a quiet place. If it's too noisy, we're going to, to change that and get you some quiet time. But I'm not negotiating whatever it is they're trying to negotiate. So is there anything else, Melissa? Well, I've just um, seen a great question. Sorry. How do you rephrase? How do you rephrase the word no? That's a great one. If someone finds that out, please tell me. Um, it, it is really, really tricky. Sometimes rather than answering the question or rephrasing them, you can try distracting them. So, and it could be around calming them down. So it could be, and that's where it's really important to find out what, um, what do they enjoy doing? What do they find calming? So they might be getting dressed. Can we have this? Can we, how about we put a DVD on, particularly if it's their favorite DVD? How about we put some nice music on? So rather than answering the question, just completely divert it. Okay. So, and people okay. happy, just aware of time. So, and there's quite a lot of content in the second part. So, if everyone's really happy, we're just going to have a five minute break, which by my count comes to about 7.53. So, if people just want a quick comfort break, if you want to grab a drink, if you need to go and check on somebody whilst we're talking, um, we're just, I'm just going to pop up a slide as a break slide. So, take five minutes, grab a drink if needs be. And I'll have a quick look through um, the chat whilst we're on the break. So, thank you very much, everyone. So what I'm going to do, just some hopefully people are coming back, I'm going to carry on screen sharing. We'll do a quick recap of where of the first section before we move to the next one. So, so just a quick recap. So just remember that all distress behavior is a form of communication. The distress happens for a reason and it is outside of their control. It might feel like it occurs in isolation, but it doesn't. There's normally a reason for it, even if it does feel like it. The first step to changing distress behavior is understanding what the behavior is trying to communicate or the function of the behavior. When we understand that, we can then start changing some things and the individual, we can teach them how to learn new ways of communicating. So what we're aiming for is anticipating that stress might build up and eventually trigger a meltdown or a shutdown and preventing it from building it up by creating a plan. So in order to do that, the first step, what we need to do is we're going to use something called functional analysis or positive behavior support. Some people might have heard of that. And it's a bit like being a detective. There are no absolutes here. We don't know everything. Certainly if there's interoception and misunderstandings going on, we're not going to know everything. So we're going to be creative. We're going to keep a record, which we call an ABC chart. So when you're doing these, you can keep the chart by yourself, but what I suggest you do is that when you come to the bit where you're actually looking at some of the patterns of behaviours, is do it with somebody, because it can be quite hard to see the patterns, particularly if you're part of the pattern, so it's helpful to get an independent person, and if you're kind of having a little bit of a play around with what could we do differently to see if that influences the behaviour or change the behaviours, it's great to have someone else to come up with some ideas with you, but what we're going to be doing is looking for patterns in the behaviours. So as part of the record, what we're going to be looking at the a b's and the c so the antecedents is what was happening before the event so who was there what was said b is for behaviors so we're going to describe what happened was it a meltdown was it a shutdown what did you notice were they hitting shouting screaming biting hair pulling were they targeting somebody and c is the consequences so what happened afterwards as a result of the behavior so this what happens afterwards can be the whole point of the communication. So if someone's really overwhelmed, complete sensory overload, and they scream and start shouting, most people stop and look. And actually, you've achieved silence, briefly. But actually, that might be what the behaviour, what the distress is about. They're completely sense, gone into sensory overload and they need a quieter, less stimulating environment. So what we do know is that what happens afterwards might accidentally reinforce the behaviour. And if that happens, it's strengthening the chances of the behaviour happening again. So the helpful thing is starting to understand if there is a pattern. So it is the behaviour 
happening repeatedly and are they getting the same response is that what the point of the behavior is and then can we have a think about is how else can we achieve that without them getting too overwhelmed that they need to get distressed to achieve the same result the good news in terms of reinforcement is is that you can also intentionally reinforce other behaviors the ones that you would like um, with praise and other things to reinforce that and that helps influence the positive behavior change as well so it goes both ways but we're just going to start off with by understanding and getting a look at what we think might be going on so top tip here is don't forget to look at the strengths and any times and places when the behavior doesn't occur and that is so important because when we do these records we're really focusing on the difficult behavior the bits that we find really challenging um, what we're not thinking about is well does this happen at school does this happen at a friend's house does this happen at nanny's house and if not, why not? That's a really important question. So that might give us some clues as to how um, things that we might want to put in the plans, to how we can do things differently. So the first step we're going to do is to observe and record. So please, top tip, just identify one behaviour you'd like to address. I'm sure there may be many. Um, you can come up with a list, but only change one thing at a time. It gets far too confusing for you, other adults around you, and the young person themselves. So when we're recording, and I'll show you a little example in a minute, um, we're going to add time and date, where it happened. So we've got then the antecedent, what was happening before. Definitely include who was present, maybe in the background. So it might be siblings in the background, not necessarily in the forefront, in the foreground. Uh, what actually happened? So describing the behaviour. What happened as a result? So how did you manage? How did you react? How did other people react? How did they eventually calm themselves down? So that might be relatively quickly. It may not. It might be they've been rumbling on for several hours and they needed a lot of quiet and space in order to do that. You can do this two ways you can do these plans. Normally we do them without the young person being aware, but if you've got an older young person um, and they might themselves be raising questions that I don't know why I'm reacting in this way, I really don't like it. There's lots of shame and embarrassment and guilt associated with losing control in, in, in the when you get a meltdown. Um, so you could, if the young person's willing and able to be involved, you can involve them and you could ask them a little bit around their internal thoughts at the time. Now they may not know, so you may not get an answer. Um, and you know, please, please don't ask them in the middle of the meltdown what they were thinking, what might trigger them off, because they're not gonna be able to tell you. Uh, it could make the meltdown worse. Uh, if it's still in the rumbling phase, you can end up re-triggering them. Um, so it's best to ask them hours, maybe a couple of days later, maybe even a week later, and say, can you remember what happened then? Can we just have a little bit of think about this and see if we can piece some things together? So in terms of keeping the records, it depends on the behaviour, what you're looking at. So these behaviours might happen several times a day, which means if you keep the record for a couple of weeks, you'll have plenty of information to have a look at. It might be something that happens maybe infrequently. So once a fortnight, once a month, you go, actually, it just happens out of the blue. You might need to keep that record a lot longer to be able to start looking at any kind of patterns. Whilst you're keeping the record, please don't do anything differently. Don't start changing your reactions because then we don't know what was causing it or perhaps reinforcing it in the first place. So just carry on as per normal. Quite often say, don't let the young person know that you're recording it. So don't in the middle of a meltdown go, I've got to grab a piece of paper and a pen. I've got to write this down. Please don't do that. Um, do it afterwards in the evening if it's the next day that's absolutely fine it does not have to be an essay we're just looking at some prompts and some clues to help you remember what was going on uh, some people like to keep the notes in the phone um, try and keep them where the young person can't find them they're normally quite embarrassed if they then work out what's going on because they don't like people just paying attention to all, the, all of their difficult behaviors okay so this is an example and what we're looking at. So we're just creating a table here, time and date, where it happened, what was happening before, your antecedent, your behaviour, what actually happened, consequence. And if you're working with a young person, if they can access their thoughts, maybe a little thought or two there. So it's just about being a detective with you. But we're being curious. We don't know what's going on. Let's see if we can find out any patterns or triggers. So if it's, when you've taken this for a little while, this is the bit where you might need someone to help you with, um, is start having a look at the information you've got. So we start by looking at the A's, so the antecedents. So can we start finding some patterns in terms of what was happening before? So I've added in the day of the week. Um, um, and uh, in my example that we come up with in a minute is uh, talking about Sundays. So are there things, Sunday's a day before Monday, Monday's a school day. So you might find that their tolerance threshold is a lot lower on a Sunday 
than any other day of the week because of their anticipation of going back to school. So if you're doing things at the weekends, maybe you need to have more of the activities on a Saturday and a bit more of a quieter day on the Sunday. Think about times of the day. So some young people engage in quite a lot of rituals. So there could be morning rituals, bedtime rituals that they're engaging with. And part of that could be about unwinding, self-soothing, calming down. So if at the weekend uh, you suddenly come in and you, you don't necessarily have the same routine at the weekend, so they might have got up, they might have had a lie in, it's 10 o'clock and you're suddenly saying we're going out and they haven't had time to go through their morning ritual, you're going to get a big reaction, you're likely to get a meltdown and they're going to really struggle. They might struggle for the rest of the day because they just haven't been able to prepare themselves properly for the day. So when we're looking um, at what's happening before, please do remember what we call slow triggers. So this is around the autistic overwhelm, what's possibly been building up over a longer period of time. So it may not be what's happened in the here and now, and nothing to do with what's happened in the here and now. It may be that there's just so much pressure on them. Exams is, is, is happens quite often. We've got SATs as well for the primary age um, or little tests in school, anything that could be building that pressure up. And the tests or the exams might not be for several months, but you know that the school's may well be commenting about them um, quite regularly. So you've got a very slow build up over time. So the other one is a delayed trigger to look out for. So again, what you might find is that the child had a really difficult time, very stressful, traumatic. Um, and when we're in the middle of something that's quite stressful and traumatic, what we do is we tend to just cope. We just go into survival mode. We get through it the best we can. Now, we may not process our emotions or what went on until a much later date. So it could be days later, it could be weeks, later, it could be months later. Some people process information a year later or so. Um, but what happens is when they're suddenly feeling a little bit more safe, a bit more stable, a bit more contained, then you might suddenly start noticing meltdowns. And that's because they're starting to process those emotions so it's not just about the here and now as I say it can be a little bit tricky sometimes with the triggers we tend to look in the here and now but have a think about delayed triggers another type of trigger is a future trigger so that's anticipatory anxiety what's coming up that could make them more anxious than normal that means they're less able to cope with anything that you're asking or too much change so again that could be around could be around exams it could be a holiday coming up it could be a transition to a different school so have a think about that and another one that uh, really really tricky because you wouldn't necessarily know this is the so, other social triggers so again if you look at your plan you're thinking none of this is making sense it may be that something else is going on socially please have a think about social media um, there's loads of the apps like TikTok in particular they push information at the young person so and some of it can be rather unpleasant or difficult for them to understand um, obviously what happens with the algorithms if you click on it once actually they go oh you like this so they'll start sending you more information and when we ask our young people about three quarters of them will say that accidentally or intentionally they have seen things that they find distressing online um, there's gaming as well of course they can talk to each other through headphones if they're playing a game and they're losing a lot or someone's laughing at them, that could be quite upsetting. We've also got um, peers at school. We don't know what's happening at school. We don't know what's being said at school. It may not be something that's happened to them directly. Think about indirect as well. They may have seen someone else being bullied sort of verbally or physically, and that's upset them and now made them really anxious that that might happen to them as well. Um, and misunderstandings. So if something's going on, they completely misunderstood it. And it's made them very, very distressed. We don't necessarily know that's going on. So have a think about that when you're looking at the antecedents it's not just the ones that are kind of happening in the room have a think about some of these building up and as you can see at the bottom if none of it makes sense maybe we just need more information so maybe we just need to keep that record for another couple of weeks and see if we can start noticing patterns we just might not have enough information to start building up a pattern so once we've looked at the a's we then start looking at the consequences in terms of the behaviours, when actually it's got highly distressed, all we're doing is we're reacting to it, we're keeping them safe, we're managing them. That's not times to put lots of strategies in. What we're trying to do is understand the consequence, so what happens afterwards. So as a result of the distressed behaviour, you might find that they've received something, something physical, so it's a tangible reward. So they might have got food or drink or sweets, so think about sugar highs and lows. 
think about certainly when they're at school we know that some young people don't like eating in front of others they don't like the sounds of other people eating um, so they may not have eaten their lunch or they started eating their lunch something happened they've stopped eating their lunch so it's always worth checking checking the school do they actually know the young person's eating so they might come home hungry and angry um, so I would suggest have a think about do they just need some food um, have a think about did they work did they get something like toys or a new games? This is about them needing to be kept busy. Do they need an activity? Do they need a distraction? Have a think about if they were highly distressed, did you eventually after a while go, oh my gosh, I've forgotten to give them their medication. I know they had a tummy ache, I know they weren't quite right. I'd be given the medication. The medication's worn off and oh gosh, yes, I need to give them another dose. So was it around medication? Also have a think about, did you give something back you'd taken away? So this could be intentional or accidental. So it may be you're tidying up, you've popped something on the side. A young person's gone to a box had a complete meltdown because it's not in the box and you've gone, oh, whoops, I've left it on the side. I forgot to put it back in the box. It could be something intentional. So in terms of a consequence, you might have taken something away. Um, but actually, in another meltdown, they got so distressed that you think, oh, you know, I can't handle this. I'm just going to give it back to them because I'm super stressed. I'm super tired. I just need them to stop the meltdown and I'm giving that back to them. Second consequence of function of the behaviours so we've got four that we're going through so the second one is around social attention so are they lonely are they bored so as a response to their distress or it could be a shutdown are you paying attention to them are you asking if they're okay are you offering them reassurance maybe they're receiving hugs or comfort and I've put a note here saying that actually even negative attention is attention. So in the record, even if you're getting cross with them or shouting, pop that down, because actually that is still a consequence. So you are still acknowledging that they're there, even if you're quite angry. So make sure you're recording those on your records as well. So the third one is around stimulation and sensory sensitivity. So is there too little stimulation? So um, particularly, I know someone's put in the chat around um, chewing, Kaylee, thank you, and um, chewing and hair and chewing at clothes. So quite often they're doing that because there's not much other stimulation. So do we need to offer other activities to distract them? Do we need to offer them a different sensory stimulation? Um, certainly if they're chewing, it might be that they need a different kind of oral stimulation because they're just enjoying that. It could be self-soothing, it could be fun, it could be a way of managing stress. It could be too much stimulation so again sensory overload could be too much pain they need to get out of a situation and the final one is around escape and avoidance we do notice that anxiety plays quite a big role in this one so are they anxious about going out going to school going to busy place it could be that you that homework is a particular one for young people on the autistic spectrum it could be you've asked them to do a task or a chore and actually what they do is they go into a meltdown and then they don't do the task or the chore so actually we can have a think about there's something about that was possibly too demanding that too overwhelming they couldn't do it and actually the behaviors helped them achieve that um, that they didn't have to do or they didn't go out so i've just got a little example here in terms of a record so um it's completely made up. So I'm having a look here. We've got a little uh, scenario here at seven o 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, we've got a uh, boy and a girl. They're both in the lounge. Um, he's already pacing up and down a bit. We've then got mums come in, ask them both to get ready to go out. And that's triggered a meltdown. So he shouted, he's thrown objects, he's thrown shoes, he's hit his sister, his sister has screamed. Um, and as a result, they didn't go out. And the young person then spent most of their day in their bedroom so this is just a single incident so you know if you've got a record you might have several so you can have a look at patterns but actually I'm just going to get you to have a think about um, what happens when we're looking at just one event so what we're looking at is this is a Sunday so have we got Monday is it a school day is there lots of anticipatory anxiety so actually he's already really anxious and annoyed and asking to do anything else on a Sunday he is going to set off a meltdown is this something specific but about the date it could be that you know they don't like the 13th of may um or friday the 13th or it could be um a memory it could be something that's happened a year ago or on that particular date that's actually a bit of a trauma memory there's some other trigger going on are they sleep deprived did they do a really exceptionally difficult night last night which is just means that they have no threshold today so then we look at where it happened 
So we can already see it's in the lounge with his sister. So there's a sibling involved. So my first question is what was happening before mum came in? Now mum might not notice this, but I would always question that because actually we've already got some pacing up and down. So we've got a warning signal here that he's already agitated. He might be agitated because of something going on in the room with his sister, or it might be that he's getting ready to go out and he's agitated about that. So then we've got mum that's come in. She's asked a question, asked him to get ready. That becomes the trigger um, but there's different triggers in that so we might be looking at did when mum said can we get you know, going out did they know did you did mum forget to tell them that they've been so busy is it a sudden change of plan we're going right we've got to go out now so is it an unexpected event that's unsettled them so mum also asked both of them to get ready to go out so is there a misunderstanding here maybe the individual thought it was just them going out um without their sister or did they just think the sister was going out so it wasn't relevant to them and then it suddenly become apparent that he needs to go out as well so then we look at the consequence so what happened as a result as a result they didn't go out so what was it about this situation? It could be the triggers, it could be the place that they were going to, be it family, friends, it could be out shopping where it's going to be really noisy and hectic. So were they trying to escape or avoid something and what was it? Uh, we also have noticed here that the young person um, ended up in the bed all day, in bedroom all day. So actually, was it around lack of sleep? Was it around an autistic overwhelm? And actually, this is just like the final straw. They were already really, really struggling and just needed to spend a quiet day. So that's just one example of just looking at a sort of a, a single episode and how we can start pulling things apart. And that starts giving us some ideas or potentially what we could do differently if we're creating a plan. So um, the plan is on the basis of the positive uh, behaviour support. So it's about being proactive. We're planning ahead. We'd like to support the individual to live a good life and to develop effective ways, other ways of them getting what they need or communicating what they need. So again, if we're in the meltdown phase, we're just reacting. We're just acting to keep people safe. We're not doing anything different. Um, but a part of um, PBS as well, it's about understanding the warning signs. So uh, the signs of stress agitated and this is the adrenaline the cortisol starting to build up in their system they might be getting overstimulated so we get might get repetitive behaviors rocking we might get stimming behaviors as well they could be getting overexcited pacing tapping the eye contact might be less than normal we got might get more repetitive questions or behaviors so we need to ask ourselves is is this a good time to ask them to do whatever we're about to do if we can delay it or wait I would suggest you do if you're hitting on these warning signs. Um, sometimes you can't, you just know you're going to get a meltdown. Um, but if you can, I would be tuning into those warning signs. So step three then is devising and implementing a plan. So this is where we start being a little bit creating and testing some of these things out, testing some of our theories out. Sometimes you try something, you get no response. You go, okay, maybe I've misunderstood. Maybe it's not about the trigger that happened before. Maybe this is more about the consequences that's reinforcing the behavior. So let's have a look at those. So, so sort of quick tips, um, think about developing routines, particularly those at weekends and holidays. So can you do something a little bit more structured for them? So again, like the school day where you've got a you know mid-morning break and a lunch at roughly at the same time and I mean so they've got a bit of a structure to work around um one of the questions that I had in advance was around uh washing so if you're asking a young person to wash and they don't like it turn that into a routine so there is an expectation we're giving advance warning so on Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays we expect you to have a wash um but also think of alternatives so if the washing in itself is incredibly distressful you know it's going to cause a meltdown have a think now what we do know the autistic people is that actually they really some of them really don't like the feel of a shower um and the sensation of that falling down on their skin can be incredibly painful so um it may be you need to think about could you offer them a bath um or maybe sort of a flannel wash instead have a think about what you're using. So some of them don't like the texture of shampoo. Um, you can get soap bars or shampoo bars. So you just sort of rub them in, it kind of foams up and then you use that as a shampoo. I mean, they don't like soap, so you need to switch to a shower gel. The shower gels are also the same for as a shampoo as well as the body. But also think about smell. All these products are quite smelly. So um, perhaps have a think about getting ones that don't smell. So in terms of the routines, think about quite, including quiet times in their day, particularly after school. So this is a common question. How do I manage my young child after they come to school? They might be masking all day, they might be exhausted. Um, what do we do? So 
sometimes letting the young person know that when they come home and when I mean come home go straight home uh, it's not about deviating to the shops on the way or having a very long chat with with somebody else in the playground because actually whilst you're doing that there are actually the 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 cortisol and the adrenaline is building up even more um so as long as you reassure them, right, we'll try and get home as soon as we can. And they know that when they get home, they might have half an hour, an hour where it's quiet. You're not going to ask them. You're not going to mention the word homework. The siblings are not around them. If they're sharing a bedroom, you need to have a think. Is there somewhere else in the house that they can go for a regular bit of quiet time? Or can you um, sort of contract with the sibling that they're not around and they actually let that person in, leave them in their room for that period of time? But that really helps. So even if they're going to explode, sometimes they can hold that in because they know they've got that quiet time. And that could be around other events. If you've got busy weekend, or you're meeting up with lots of people, they might not want to go in the first place. So you might need to think about that. But if they have to come with you, it's about acknowledging how difficult and exhausting that is and saying, that's fine, we come home, you know, literally, we won't talk to you for a couple of hours, you know, you go and have quiet time um and calm down as all self sees so advanced warnings is great so have a think about so if they're a bit older like a weekly planner um you can put water notifications in their phones if they've got those um, and have a think about planning A, B and C. So a different kind of an A, B and C. So if you're saying to them right at the weekend, we're going to go out to the park, uh, obviously, if it's good weather. But what's plan B if it's wet weather? So prepare a plan B. So we might go swimming or we might stay in, indoors and just watch a film together or you can watch a film. But plan A and plan B don't like unexpected change we can't always predict the weather we can't predict things like um car breaking down so do we need a plan c as well in there and that really helps in terms of creating flexibility so in the future they'll have their plan a's but if they only ever have plan a and then it goes wrong they've got no way of coping with it so you're teaching you're modeling that to them saying okay you can have a plan a or a plan b and a plan c and we'll just see on the day so you're helping them so um it's about it's kind of giving them an advance warning because you've got plan a b and c so depending on the young person and what they're like, I'm now going to say the opposite. So if this is someone that gets really anxious about things that are happening in the future, so anticipatory anxiety, you might need to reduce the warning times instead. So everyone's different. different. So have a chat with the young person and say, look, if we've got an event that we know you're going to find difficult, do you go to the dentist or something you don't enjoy? Um, when do we tell you? Do you want to know two weeks in advance so we can start planning coping strategies? What are you going to do on the day to distract yourself, to, to help yourself? Or do you want to tell you the day before? Or do we tell you on the morning? OK, some of them might be able to give you straight answers. And some might say mm, it depends what it is. Uh, you may then not kind of need to write down a bit of a crib sheet on all these different things and then get some different um, advice on when to tell them. Something else you can do is contract. You can contract with the young person as well. So that could be around, um, particularly one of the other questions was around traveling in the car, if they're unsafe in the car. So it's about creating um, safety rules. So when you sit in the car, you sit seat belts on, you keep your hands to yourself. And then you need to think of some sort of incentive or reward after that. So sometimes it really helps when you've got other people involved here. So this is when we're saying about notice those times where they don't do the behaviours. So you might find that actually they're better at school. They do it differently at school. Might be masking, but actually they don't have the same level of meltdown or they don't do it when nanny's around or at nanny's house. So you can contract with them, bring these people in to help you. So you might say, look, you know, um, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this one behaviour. And if you sit in the car and we do a journey and you've kept your hands yourself, kept the seatbelt on, we're going to ring nanny or we're going to message nanny or FaceTime nanny right at the end. Um, and we're going to say how well you did in the journey. And, you know, as long as nanny's on board, then nanny can come back and say, well done as well. Um, or you might say, actually, we're going to tell the teacher how well you've done. So it's not necessarily the punitive bits. If they haven't done well, they haven't managed it, we're not putting in any consequences. Just when they do do it, and this is what we said about using intentional reinforcement force them to shape the papers we do want them to do we give them lots of positive praise if they're happy with that or whatever the incentive might be so in terms of safety in contracting we might also contract with them we only do it when they're calm and when they're able to have a discussion you don't do that in the middle of a meltdown so we're just planning this is advanced planning if you're at home and you're going to meltdown i'd like you to go into your bedroom OK, or somewhere else. So you pre agree that. So in the middle of a meltdown, you're saying going to your brain, it's not a surprise. Actually, you do need to practice that. And sometimes young people eventually take themselves off. They might slam the door, but I'm not so worried about that because actually they are implementing the plan. They have taken themselves off somewhere. 
Okay. Um, same with school, it might be that there's a certain place to go, particularly if they like to, to run out of the building, you contract with them, this is where you're going to go when you're feeling upset, and they do tend to, to work with that really well. So in terms of incentives, um, please think about things that are cheap, small, you need to be able to give it to them relatively immediately, not something that you build up and, and they get months later. Um, if they earn it, never take it away. Uh, they have earned it. And think about the things that bring them joy, things that they like, things that are fun in their lives. So use those as incentives. So another thing you can add into your plan is around improving communication. And this is one of the key parts of the plan. So there are different ways of doing that. Some people um, use traffic light systems, the red, amber, green. You can use scaling so you can turn this into numbers. Um, you can put faces, you can use faces that are, you know, happy and not so happy in between, neutral um, and angry at the top as well. So you can help them recognise different faces. But the point of the traffic light system is like quite a quick communication method, particularly when we're using scaling. So that's the numbers. You can tune in pretty quickly. So you can do this with the young person. So the idea is, is then we've got the numbers. So you've got one, two and three. So normal the rumbling phase and the meltdown. What we're doing is we're describing what those phases look like. So normal might be, and you describe their normal behavior and get them to understand that. So you then work with them to understand what the rumbling phase is. They may not know their warning signs. If they're struggling with interoception, they're not going to pick these things up. So actually you can describe them. So it might be things you've noticed. They could have things they've noticed as they get better with it. So are they worried, frustrated, agitated, increase in repetitive behaviours and questions, increase in tolerance for change. They're all your warning signs, your amber warning signs. And then number three is your meltdowns or your shutdowns, or they could be completely overexcited. So you might do a little description, but that's less important. But what's really helpful with the scaling is kind of when you ask a child, you know, how are you? You're not going to get a great response sometimes, or they're not going to have the language to be able to explain everything that's going on inside their bodies and inside their heads. So it's easier for them to go, I'm a number two. You go, OK, right, great. I know what that means. So in the third column that we see here, this is your action plan. So it's an action plan for you and other adults around you can involve siblings in it's really important whatever you do that other people in your house do the same so make sure they're part of this or they're aware of how they're responding if you're changing something so obviously if we're in the number three it's a meltdown or a shutdown we're limiting demands we're reducing sensory stimulation we might be getting them into a quiet place we're keeping them safe okay and I've added in here is the don't says and young people actually quite like this because when you say oh uh, what's really annoying when you're having a meltdown they'll go when my parents say how are you what can I do or well, what's wrong with you so don't say it's because actually it's really helpful you can add that into your number two your rumbling phase as well what do you not want me to say not do you not want me to do um because some of those actually might if you're in a two if you're in a rumbling phase and you start going what's wrong what's wrong what's wrong you tell me what's wrong you're going to tip them into the three so they love the don't says and the don't do so and they might be different depending on the the person so it might be okay for one parent to ask something it might not be okay for the other one so you can do a little different columns for different people um, but it helps them understand so everyone likes to know what to do particularly if things are in the rumbling phase so you can develop this plan with them so the other thing you can have a look at is changing the way you or others react and saying about getting everyone involved in this do you need to adjust your expectations are you just asking them to do too much juicy battles there's probably many, many things that sometimes set young people off, particularly if they're particularly overwhelmed and getting distressed and it's just building up. So have a think about what are the important ones that, you know, boundaries that you need to put in place for today, which ones are less important. Think about those warning signs. If you're noticing the warning signs, do you really need to do this now? Do you need to ask them to do this now? And I put the scales there because what really want you to have a think about is balancing out the positives through the days. So there may be plenty of no's and don't do that and please calm down and move away. Don't hit your sister. What are you doing to praise them? So how can you kind of go, oh, that was really great. Thank you for being quiet. Thank you for being helpful. Thank you for not hitting your sister. Anything that you can put in there to help that balance. They feel like they're doing OK, because quite often the message they're getting is that they're not doing OK. So like we said, change the behavior of others. So that's other people in the household as well. Get them involved. Please don't say anything you can't follow through. So don't say, right, okay, if you do that again, I'm going to take your entire PlayStation away. Can you really? Um, 
you know, pack it up, move it out of the way, keep it out of the way. Don't do, don't say anything because they will know. They will know you can't follow through on it. So sometimes you might need to practice this in advance. So have a think about um, what consequences you might put in place if you need to put those consequences in place. So it's not a, a reaction, particularly when you're angry and dealing with a difficult situation. It's not a reaction. Um, you've already pre-thought something through. The main part of this, the quick tip, is around being consistent. So you're doing the same thing every single time. Other people are doing the same as what you're doing. You could potentially ask other family members if other households or at school to do something similar if you're changing the behaviour. Quite often it's quite sometimes faster to change behaviour if everyone around them is doing something different rather than asking the young person to do something different. So I'm just going to finish off because I'm aware of time. So finish off with some top tips. Um, so if you're going to do something different and do a plan, choose something that's less important, something that's a little bit easier to start off with. Don't go for the really difficult behaviours. It just helps you get used to being a detective, using the recording and being creative of changing some of the things that happened before or some of the things that happened afterwards. Please don't be surprised if behaviour gets worse before it gets better. It's called an extinction burst. It's pretty normal. So we would expect that to happen, particularly if what you're doing is successful, because if you change your behaviour, it's going to confuse the young person and they're going to increase their normal behaviour. going, oh, this is a bit bizarre. I'll just up the ante a little bit more. And then my parent or my adult will go back to doing what they were doing before because I don't like what they're doing now. So do keep persisting. If it gets worse, don't give up after a few days keep going you need to get through that extinction burst the only time i'd say stop doing that is if they become highly distressed and they start self-harming or engaging in risky behaviors then you do need to stop okay we also had a question around sort of older young people particularly those at 17 that are struggling to go out of the house finding it very difficult and looking at how we develop their independence so what i'd want you to do is have a think about is can you develop their independence inside the home first? They're not going to develop it outside of the home if they haven't learned those skills and the confidence to do things within the home. So if they're doing not talking too much within the household, they're not going to talk much outside. So let's see if you can build up their confidence and experience of talking a little bit more in the house. If you don't eat meals together, they don't like eating meals together, it might be that that's a skill that you can work on. So if they want to go out with friends or go out for dinner with people, do it in the house first before you go out. Things like um, household chores, tasks things like cooking using the washing machine um, doing online shopping all these great basic skills that you can help to build hopefully they're looking at becoming independent in the future they will need some of these skills um, and actually all you're doing is helping them to feel confident and giving them that success by practicing those and these are my final top tips. I've sort of written them out so they'll go into your digital um, little goodie bag. So please help them understand it's not their fault. This is a hormonal reaction. Um, they can't control the, the hormones once they're released. They've got to get rid of, they've got to burn, so burn them off. So if we can help them understand it is a stress response, it's very normal what's going on. It really helps them to reduce the shame and the embarrassment and some of the self-blame that goes along with it. So it's just that sort of scientific bit. Um, and ex helping them to explain a little bit about interoception, that they might not be understanding those signals or getting them at the last minute, particularly around toileting. That could be quite a difficult one. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely. They may not know until the last minute and then you're going to have accidents. So tell them that that's absolutely normal. With the toileting, you might need to go into a regular toileting program. So just sort of say, actually, OK, we're going to go to the toilet every hour. You need to look at what works for them, even if they're not if their bladder's not full you just ask them to go same things with being hungry and thirsty if they're really not good at picking up on those cues so if they've got a mobile phone you can just put reminders in so you know at a you know atm make sure you have a breakfast and a drink you know 11 o'clock have a snack and a drink so get the phone to do the reminders it's not just you chasing them up the whole time like I said before, you can use reinforcement to your advantage. So again, work out what they enjoy, what they find, what, what's fun. Um, when they're having a quiet time, when they've managed a difficult situation or when they've calmed themselves down. So you've had the meltdown. You may not want to reward the meltdown. You wait until they're a little bit calmer, if it's a little bit calmer, and then you give them something when they're a little bit calmer. You're rewarding the fact they've calmed themselves down a little bit. Very different to them feeling that they've got it because they've engaged in distress behaviour. You reward the calming down. OK, um, so um, please, please always notice the times when they're not distressed. So what brings them joy? What how are they having fun? What distracts them? 
what calms them down. They're all really useful to put into to your plans um, and to reinforce. So I'm pretty much at the end. I know I've had lots of questions around sort of services, accessing services, just a couple that I wanted to mention here. We've got the National Autistic Society. They do have a website with some behaviour information online. So they've got um, information you can read around anger management, dealing with change, distress behaviour, um, meltdowns, eating issues, obsessions, repetitive behaviours. They are actually, they have got a, a National Autism Show in London London in June, so that's the 9th and 10th of June. Um, I think there is a charge. Some people could, might be able to get into free. I think the maximum cost is £27.50 for a ticket, but there's lots going on there in June. Uh, Reaching Families is also um, a really, really helpful parent carer sort of charity based support group. They run training and workshops via Zoom. Um, again, on topics that you might find interesting, so understanding autism, ADHD, managing stress, making sense of SEN and support at school, um, just a that someone had mentioned about getting an education healthcare plan needing a diagnosis you shouldn't need a diagnosis for that an education healthcare plan is about the school creating the evidence that actually that they need more resources to support this young person diagnosis is helpful but you don't need to have them um so in terms of reaching families, there's just a little leaflet that I've put in. It's the front and the back of the leaflet that will go in the digital goodie pack. Um, they also uh, produce it's, it's quite a thick booklet it's called making sense of it all from birth to adult for anyone a young person with uh, SCN special educational needs um, it's a guide for parents it was written for carers parents and carers and it talks about the different stages um, and what other support and SEN support that you might um, need or information that you might like to read up on um, it's available on the website you can just download it or I think you can contact them and ask for a written copy another top one that I like recommending is Sendias so this is an independent um, organization sort of affiliated with the local education authority but they will give you free and impartial and confidential advice about any issues that you have in terms of school and difficulties engaging with schools so and um, they've got fact sheets and guides and videos as well